Hi there, this is Solitron from Solitron Films and welcome to another Top 10 video. And today's video is going to be on Billy Wilder, um, who is one of the all-time great directors. Um, I haven't seen all of Billy Wilder's films, he, made, he directed 27 films, I've only seen 16. So I can't really speak on things like Kiss Me Stupid or The Seven Year Itch or Sabrina. This is one of the hardest top 10s I've had to amass because out, even out of the 16 um, I had a little trouble whittling it down to 10. So first of all I'll just show you the ones that didn't quite make it. So there was no room for Avanti which is still an enjoyable film, one of his later ones. There's no room for Orma La Douche, which is probably my least favourite one. It's just a little bit too long. Um, this is a Kino Lorba edition that is coming to Eureka Masters of Cinema. We are lucky in the sense because most of these films are actually on Eureka Masters of Cinema or coming to Eureka Masters of Cinema. There's no room for 1, 2, 3, which is again an enjoyable film. Again, that's coming to Eureka. There's no room for the fortune cookie. And shock horror, controversy, no room for some like it hot. Which, personally, I've never really been a huge fan of. Um, it is a good film. Um, but I've just never really been that big a fan of it. Again, um, let me know your top 10s. Um, we are lucky, like I say, um, most of Billy Wilder's films are actually available to see on um, good Blu-ray releases by Masters of Cinema. Um, Billy Wilder was one of the directors who came from Europe and kind of took over Hollywood, like Fritz Lang and Robert Sidemack and um, lots of other ones, um, Andre de Toth. And he had a major collaborator in IEL Diamond, who co wrote 12 of his films, including um, lots of his classics, lots of his greatest works. I mean, you could argue he is one of those filmmakers that has five or six masterpieces, um, five or six almost perfect films. Um, obviously as he grew older um, his later films weren't as successful. There was lots of um, different casting choices. They very rarely got the person he was actually after for roles for one reason or another. Um, but they still managed to make um, good to very good films later in his career, even though at the time they didn't do very well. So we're going to start at number 10, and this is his second last film, which again wasn't a success. It's Fedora. This is from 1978 and stars William Holden. This is Eureka Massive Cinema 147. Um, it's an interesting film in the sense that it's almost a companion piece to Sunset Boulevard. It's about a washed up film producer played by William Holden who tracks down this wonderful act actress of the past called Fedora who is hiding in isolation in a Mediterranean um, island. She stays with a countess, um, so he tries to 
um, get into the Countess's good graces to try and speak to Fedora, to try and convince her to come back and make one last film. Um, it's quite a slow burn of a film. Again, like all of his later works, I would say it's maybe a little over long. But there are wonderful moments in it. He always said he made comedies when he was feeling down and he did dramas when he was feeling happy. Um, this is more downbeat. Um, you do get the feeling this is somebody looking nearer the end of his life rather than the beginning even though he did live almost another 20 years after he made his last film in 1981 um, it is about the end of an era of that era of Hollywood um, Henry Fonda makes an appearance as himself as the head of the Academy Awards who comes to deliver Fedora and Oscar for a lifetime achievement. Um, there is something that happens about two thirds of the way through the film but if you haven't seen it I'm not going to um, spoil it. It's not his best film um, but there is moments of that Billy Wilder genius. Um, it is kind of tragic, it is kind of bleak, it is kind of dark, which is the kind of things that I like about Billy Wilder. Um, and it is worth watching and having. But obviously, at number 10, there's a reason it's at number 10, and it's not quite you know, from 16 um, to 10, they're not films that, you know, if nobody's ever seen a Billy Wilder film, you wouldn't necessarily recommend them or go watch Fedora first. Um, but again, it's a film I hadn't seen before. Um, and yes, it's a bit slow, but once it gets going, um, it is worth seeing. So number nine is Stalag 17, one of his successes. Um, this is Master of the Cinema 117 and this is from 1953. I should say all the Masters of Cinema releases have really good extras, and really interesting extras. Um, Stalag 17 is based on a play um, about prisoners of war, American prisoners of war um, and it's a comedy and it's about, again, stars William Holden as a kind of go-getter, kind of cynical um, anti-hero, if you like. And they seem to have um, a spy in their group because the Germans always seem to find out where their escape tunnels are and so part of it is a drama, a whodunit of essentially who's the spy and part of it is just a a dark comedy really driven by William Holden um, who may have got an Oscar for it, I'm not quite sure um, but has, he's just got a great performance um, and it's well worth having. I know some people perhaps have a problem with the tone because it is a comedy um, there are kind of two characters that are almost straight slapstick which doesn't really work the best um, that's why for me it's only at number 9 um, but it's still a very good film and I should say kind of all of Billy Wilder's films are just shot so beautifully and framed so beautifully um, he is a master at putting the camera where it needs to be. Um, I mean, allegedly he was never that easy to work with. He was certainly never that easy to write with. Um, but 
it's not really much of a surprise because I'm sure quite a lot of the great directors of the past probably wouldn't work nowadays because people wouldn't put up with it anymore. Um, but in those days, great directors had a bit more leeway as far as their attitude. Um, and with Billy Wilder, it certainly pays off because his work's there to be seen. So at number eight, it's another Eureka Massive Cinema. It's Witness for the Prosecution. This is number 194 in Eureka series. And this stars Tyrone Power, Marlena Dietrich and Charles Lawton. It's based on the Agatha Christie courtroom drama. But what really gives it its spark is Charles Lawton's performance, which is just fantastic. Um, if there's any people out there who aren't familiar with Charles Lawton, you need to pick up a copy of Witness for the Prosecution. He's absolutely fantastic in it. Um, it's full of wonderful Wilder and Diamond um, wit. And for, you know, a courtroom drama, it is actually... It's 116 minutes. I thought it was actually longer than that. Um, it does zip along. And even though it is in a courtroom, there's enough business going on. Um, especially with Charles Lawton's um, alcohol consumption. Um, it's... It's a great wee film. Again, you could argue Marlena Dietrich is a little bit miscast. Um, originally, somebody else was going to play Tyrone Powers' um, role, but again, it worked out because I think Witness of Prosecution was very successful. Um, it's about a man who's accused of murder and Charles Lawton is defending him. And again, I'm not going to say much more about the plot than that. Um, again, it's shot in really nice black and white. And it's one that I would certainly recommend picking up. Um, the next two are perhaps controversial. Um, but at number seven is The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. And this is Eureka Master Cinema 182. This is from 1970. So this is um, kind of the second chapter of his, his work, his later films. And this is an absolute blast. Um, again, it was a film I saw years ago and I haven't seen it since. But then I picked it up on um, Blu-ray and it's just fantastic. Um, I'm not perhaps the biggest fan of Sherlock Holmes, um, even though I do have quite a few versions um, of Hound of the Baskervilles, for example. But this is just a wonderful film, but the problem was on its release, it kind of didn't find an audience. People were kind of baffled with it because they were wanting a kind of straightforward um, Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes and it's not quite that or they were wanting a kind of Billy Wilder takes the mickey out of Sherlock Holmes and it's not that either um, it's 125 minutes which flies by which is always a good sign um, the original cut was 200 minutes um, there's really great extras on that edition as well because um, they're always hoping that that other 75 minutes turns up um, and we could get a 200 minute version of the film which would be awesome but at 125 minutes it's fantastic um, it's maybe not everybody's cup of tea um, Christopher Lee turns up as Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock Holmes' brother. Queen Victoria turns up. Um, it's set in Loch Ness. I mean, it's, it is fantastic. I would highly recommend it, even though not everybody's going to like it. 
um, and not everybody liked it when it came out. But I do think it's underappreciated. And I do think that hopefully on the Eureka edition more people will check it out. Um, and who knows, maybe one day we'll get the 200 minute version. So, number six, which now thinking I might actually swap them round, but let's go. Number six is the only film in the top ten that I don't actually have on Blu ray. And this is Buddy Buddy, his last film starring Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, and Klaus Kinski's even in it. Um, this isn't a great film. Um, it was a disaster when it came out. Um, it is his last film. You could argue that maybe perhaps Fedora should have been his last film. That would be a nice bow. Um, but he still wanted to make films. He still wanted to make films after Buddy Buddy. But Hollywood being the fickle place it is, um, he never really got the kind of money to make more films after Buddy Buddy. Um, and his collaborators were either unwell or were dying off. Um, so his last film was Buddy Buddy. Again, not a perfect film. But it really pops because it's Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon again who were in the fortune cookie and his version of the front page. Um, Walter Matthau plays a hitman and Jack Lemmon plays somebody who's recently divorced or in the process of getting a divorce and has booked into the same hotel as Walter Matthau, the room next door, and is trying to kill himself. Again, it's a fairly standard setup. The film is a bit of a mess as Jack Lemon gets involved with his um, soon to be ex wife's um, sex therapist, Klaus Ginsky, who is, um, gives a typical Klaus Ginsky performance. So, again, it's not a perfect film. It's just personal choice that I've put it at number six, even though I might actually flip flop Sherlock Holmes and Buddy Buddy. Um, you can let me know what you think of what top ten you have for Billy Wilder films and which one of Sherlock Holmes or Buddy Buddy should be higher. Um, so, n not a lot of people like it, but then I'm a bit of a contrarian and I just love Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau as Walter Matter gets more and more exasperated um, as Jack Lemmon keeps interfering with his plans. So again, it is, it is a comedy, but it's obviously it's about suicide and murder in typical Billy Wilder fashion. Um, and hopefully Eureka Masters of Cinema release it in a Blu-ray. Again, that's just a Spanish DVD I have of it. Um, again, please let me know if there there is a, a better version or a Blu-ray version available somewhere. So that's number six or seven, depending on whether I change my mind. So really, for me, the top five are just solid masterpieces. The top five, if I ever do this magical top 125 films of all time, um, these five are going to be in that 125 or 150 or 200. So number five is Double Indemnity. This is Eureka Massive Cinema number 44 and this is from 1944. And this is probably, well it is his first great film. Um, and this is wonderful film noir. It's told in flashback like one of his other films that appear in this list and it stars Fred McMurray and Edward G. Robinson as insurance 
investigators and Fred McMurray tells the story in flashback. Um, involves Barbara Stanwyck and Edward uh, Fred McMurray um, falling for her hook, line and sinker um, and getting into the usual film noir trouble. But again, the script is just fantastic. The performances are electric. I mean, Fred McMurray has never been on anybody's list as the greatest actor in the world, but certainly in a couple of Billy Wilder films, he's really good. Um, Edward G. Robinson, I mean, the script, he's, the role he's given is fantastic, and his kind of performance and the fact that he really cares about Fred McMurray's character, even though he's in trouble and he keeps getting into trouble. Um, it's one of the great film noirs and you should immediately go and buy it if you haven't already. Um, there's not much more to say about it apart from it's really, really good. Um, Wilder was just a tremendous craftsman, um, just a great writer. His films always have that darkness and that kind of cynical edge, um, which some people like, some people don't like. Um, and how the story develops is quite clever, um, and why it's called Double Indemnity. Um, yeah, it's just a great film. Everybody should really know it and have it and um, like it. So number four is The Apartment. Another film with Fred McMurray in it. This is the Arrow Academy limited edition box set with the book of writings and the actual Blu-ray. This is from 1960. Um, this is perhaps his second f most famous film, or maybe his most famous film, apart from Some Like It Hot. And it stars Jack Lemmon, Fred McMurray and Shirley MacLaine. Um, and Jack Lemmon plays a working stiff who loans out his apartment at the weekends and Friday nights um, to his bosses who are cheating on their wives. Um, so it's... It has great social commentary. It has wonderful performances. It's romantic without being romantic. It's... Jack Lemmon has gives a great performance and has a wonderful um, shtick with a nasal spray. Um, Fred McMurray shows off a side that perhaps he hasn't shown off before, apart from a double indemnity. Um, so in the on the surface, quite like quite a lot of Billy Wilder's comedies, it kind of plays light, but underneath it, it's actually a lot darker, um, and it is about what you do to get ahead, and what you sacrifice to get ahead, and whether that's actually worth it or not. Um, again, like a lot of Billy Wilder films, the supporting cast is wonderful. You know, character actors give great turns. Um, and this film's no different with the doctor who's the neighbour who's always um, watching who's going in and out of um, Jack Lemmon's apartment. It's just fantastic. Um, again, it's one of those films that's just about perfect, um, as are quite a few Billy Wilder films in my opinion um, so that's number four number three 
is Sunset Boulevard, one of the few that isn't actually on um, Eureka Mass as a cinema, just appears that way. Um, this is a 1950 classic with William Holden, who, I don't think it's a spoiler, starts telling the story um, as a corpse in a swimming pool, which I think at the time was probably the first time that had ever been done. Um, it is one of those cliches now in cinema where a character will start in a bad position or whatever and say, oh, how did I get into this position? And then the screen comes up with a car two weeks earlier or two days earlier or six months earlier. Um, but Sunset Boulevard, I believe, was possibly the first one to feature a corpse doing a voiceover. Um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because chances are I will be. And this Sunset Boulevard just has so many layers. Um, it's about Hollywood. It's all stars Gloria Swanson, who plays a fading forgotten star who at the time was a fading forgotten star. It has just the bizarre casting of Eric von Stronheim as her butler and Eric von Stronheim was one of the great directors of the silent era. Um, his film Greed is one of the lost treasures of cinema, the full version of it. Um, along with the Magnificent Ambersons. There's, I mean, Otto Preminger is in it as himself, pretty much um, geeing her along and stringing her along because they only really wanted to use her car in the film, but she gets her hopes up during the film that they want her to come back. But it's actually just for her car. Um, there's a chimpanzee funeral. So it has this kind of weird, gothic, dark stuff going on. Um, Gloria Swanson's just fantastic. There's so many memorable lines. Um, obviously, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. DeMille. Sorry, it's not Otto Premier, it's, it's DeMille, isn't it? Sorry. Um, yeah, it's just so dark. It has black humour, really black humour. Um, there's moments in it that David Lynch would probably be proud of. Um, again, it's shot beautifully. William Holden's fantastic. Everybody in it's fantastic. Um, there's a reason it's a classic. And that's the reason it's number three. Now the top two might, well, probably be different from most people's. And um, again, like I said, I started. It's depending on your kind of outlook in life or the way you look at things. Probably what your top two Billy Wilder would be. So number two is the Lost Weekend with Ray Milland. This is the Steelbook of the Masters of Cinema. This is number 45. And this is just wonderful. It's about an alcoholic. Um, apparently Ray Milland originally didn't want to do it or wasn't the first choice, but I think he got an Oscar for it. Um, and again, Yes, the ending was influenced by the Hayes Code, but it's just, it's a great performance of Ray Milland. Um, I do love Ray Milland. Yeah, he might be a one-trick pony, but that trick's very good. The way he's always looking shifty, he's always looking though he's hiding something, he's always looking as though he's going to be found out, and of course that's perfect for playing an alcoholic. Um, He's a writer, um, and this just follows his downward spiral on a long weekend, um, where he promises 
they all stop drinking and he'll go away um, with his fiance. But obviously, that doesn't quite happen. Um, again, plot-wise, not a lot happens, but we just are hooked into his life, hooked into his situation, um, and you know, when he starts to drink, he's charming and he's funny, and we're charmed and we're amused. But then, obviously, as it gets worse, then our feelings towards him and our emotions towards him change. Um, he gets put into hospital and suffers from the DTs, and is the famous bat scene, um, which is actually quite disturbing, and is still a little disturbing, um, and probably scared the bejesus out of people when they first saw it in 1945. Um, yeah, this is a personal favourite of mine um, it's just a fantastic film and again wonderful support um, by the guy who plays his local barman um, it's just a great film great script brilliantly acted um, and brilliantly directed so that's number two so be glad we're near the end so what could possibly be the best or my favourite Billy Wilder film? It's Ace in the Hole. This is number 82, Masters of Cinema, with Kirk Douglas. And this is the Criterion DVD, which is number 396. What to say about Ace in the Hole? I think this might have been the first Ace in the Hole the first Ace in the Hole the first Billy Wilder film it's certainly the first Ace in the Hole film that I'd ever seen but this might be the first Billy Wilder film that I saw and I was just like blown away by it um, so I've probably loved this film for 25 years or whatever it's just fantastic this one wasn't actually co-written by I.L. Diamond. Um, Kurt Douglas, who for a while was kind of a pretty boy, really gets ugly in this. He's a ambulance chasing um, news reporter who's been bounced from city to city. Um, and he ends up in the desert a small newspaper and he gets a whiff of this miner that's been trapped in a cave in a cave in um, and decides that he has to make a bigger story of it to try and get back to Chicago or New York in a big paper and it's how he manipulates people manipulates the situation for his own ends at the price of somebody's life so this ain't a comedy this is arguably Billy Wilder's darkest film maybe that's why I like it so much um, everybody in it well not everybody in it a lot of people in it are hard boiled you could argue well there's nobody in it that's likeable but sometimes a film is just like so good you don't need to have people that are likeable or whether you root for them you just kind of stand back from the devastation and just like watch it um, this is arguably the best thing Kurt Douglas ever did I know people would argue Kubrick's Pass of Glory which is a fair shout um, but he is kind of coiled and snarling and desperate and and this ending um, what was this? this was 1951 so he did this is like a year after Sunset Boulevard um, the ending certainly not influenced by the Hayes Code um, it's just fantastic um, you know he takes a young guy under his wing who kind of looks up to him and 
and of course the the wife of the miner who's trapped you know she's enjoying the celebrity she's just wanting to get out of town and get on with her life um, there's a great line about you know she doesn't want to go to church to pray because kneeling bags or nylons um, there's just so much great dialogue that's just bitter and cynical um, and I absolutely love it <laughs> but it maybe says something about me rather than the film um, but it's a masterpiece it's it's shot beautifully in black and white but the, but you can feel the heat from the sun um, through the screen um, it's the sun sears through the screen, as does um, the cynicism and Kirk Douglas's performance is just amazing. Um, yeah, sorry for going on a rant about Ace in the Hole, but I do love that film. Um, so thank you very much for sticking with this list. Please let me know what your top 10 Billy Wilder films would be and how wrong I am. Um, in the comments below so please leave a like subscribe if you want to hear me ranting about other films and hopefully we'll see you soon this is Solitary Own Solitary Own Films saying thank you very much for watching and farewell